Hello, and welcome to this recorded webinar titled Change on the Horizon, Forensic Anthropology and Ancestry Estimation. My name is Dr. Jonathan Bethard, and I am an assistant professor here in the Department of Anthropology at the University of South Florida. Along with my colleague, Dr. Elizabeth Deganji, who is an associate professor at Binghamton University in New York, we will be discussing our thoughts about the complex topic of ancestry estimation and forensic anthropology in a webinar that will be taking place on March 22nd. This recorded webinar will help supplement some of the information that we will be discussing. In addition, we'll be talking about some new literature that is really delving into the complex question of ancestry estimation and forensic anthropology. And all of these remarks are part of a larger series titled Race and Power, Deconstructing an Illusion that the USF Department of Anthropology's Diversity and Inclusion Committee are sponsoring over the course of this academic year. We are very delighted to participate and are happy to share our thoughts on this complex topic with the audience. Before we begin, I would like to introduce the discipline of forensic anthropology to everyone. You might be asking, what is forensic anthropology? Well, forensic anthropology is an area of the broader anthropological discipline that draws on biological anthropology and archaeology in the form of expertise in the human skeleton. Forensic anthropologists use this expertise on the human skeleton to work on cases of people who are unknown deceased people who are decomposed, mummified, burned, or otherwise recognizable, and who might be part of medical examiner, coroner, or other law enforcement investigations. Forensic anthropologists use this expertise to provide answers as to people's identities and to occasionally provide information for medical examiners and coroners as to how a person might have died. Forensic anthropologists are part of a broader system related to death investigation in the United States. As you can see on this map, the way in which death investigations occur are variable and are dependent on the particular state. Some states rely on a coroner system. Other states rely on a medical examiner system. Some states have a combination. This means that the way in which a forensic anthropologist is utilized is highly dependent on the location itself. To take this point further, we'll take a look at Florida. Florida is divided into 25 medical examiner districts. And in this instance, each district is responsible for providing information related to unidentified and deceased persons. It is the medical examiner who, for example, will sign off on a death certificate in many instances, or staff for medical examiner's offices work to identify missing persons and to clarify situations related to cause and manner of death in, in, suspect, in instances where the way in which a person passed away is unknown. I'll note that in all of the instances in Florida, it is a medical examiner's office who requests the consultation of a forensic anthropologist. And so in our state here in Florida, forensic anthropologists who all happen to be university professors collaborate on an as needed basis as skeletal cases come up. Now, you might be asking how broad of a, or how frequent do cases of unidentified people occur? The answer to that question is they occur fairly frequently and they occur in a high degree in places around the United States. We know this through a database called NAMIS, which is an acronym for the missing or the national missing and unidentified persons system. At last check, when I was looking at the number of unidentified persons to record in this talk, that number was 13,630. So that means there are that many cases, not of all of which are skeletonized, but give a sense to the number of unidentified people in the United States. And the reality is that this number continues to grow so that in a week's time or two weeks time from now, 
we could probably be sure that that number is greater than 13,630. And forensic anthropologists in many instances have contributed to this case count and occasionally work on helping make identifications of those unidentified people. Now, how does a forensic anthropologist extract information from the skeleton to provide medical legal stakeholders important information related to human identification? Typically, this basic piece of analysis for unknown human remains or unknown human skeletal remains is called the biological profile. The biological profile has historically included the variables of sex, age, stature, and ancestry. And for example, we use what we know about the skeleton to make estimates about a person's biological sex. We, for instance, use portions of our pelvis to make this information or to read this information and provide it. Again, the idea is that the biological profile helps narrow down a list of possible matches between unknown people in a particular region and the skeletal remains that we're analyzing. We do the same thing when it comes to an age estimate. We're interested to know if the decedent or the deceased person was in their 20s, their 40s, or their 60s, for instance. And we, for example, use portions of the pelvis of a joint surface called the pubic symphysis, as you're seeing in this image of casts of pubic symphysis, symphyses. We also use information from our long bones, from our arms and legs, to reproduce or estimate how tall someone is. This information is useful in conjunction with sex estimation and, and age estimation. The fourth component of the biological profile that has been factored in to forensic anthropology in the United States is that of ancestry estimation. Ancestry estimation has had a long history and has had a fairly controversial history because of the way in which early forensic anthropologists didn't think of this topic in the form of ancestry estimation. It was actually called race estimation and comes from a time when physical anthropologists thought that human groups could be sorted into any number of particular categories that correspond with the kinds of social labels that we're all familiar. Forensic anthropologists have suggested that this is possible to do because of the way in which the skeleton has evolved to various climactic places of varying geography around the world. And they have linked those kinds of skeletal changes deduced or analyzed from analyses of measurements of the cranium, craniofacial morphology, which have recently been termed morphoscopic traits, and the shape and form of teeth to sort people into human groups. This aspect of forensic anthropology has been embedded quite deeply in the discipline, despite critiques that in whatever instance, and regardless of the intention of the investigator, that it's really a perpetuating a debunked idea about the fixity of human biological races. Despite critiques that have happened for many years, forensic anthropologists have privileged human identification over the debate related to whether or not this should occur. This is a very complex area of investigation because as Meyer and colleagues recently described that even the terms that we use in the forensic sciences and in forensic anthropology are variable. We know the complexities of social terminology, folk taxonomies, and human identity. And while we can think about, say, the ways in which we check boxes in the US Census, for example, that that kind of framework has been very inconsistent across the forensic sciences, including forensic anthropology, to where maybe two forensic anthropologists report a different kind of terminology about the same particular individual, for example. All of this 
has muddied the water tremendously as to what ultimately forensic anthropologists do. We also know, and forensic anthropologists have probably not been part of this conversation, that despite the good intentions of forensic anthropologists, that we operate in a system, a medical legal system and a criminal justice system, which does not treat people the same. There's a, an enormous amount of literature, for example, that looks at racial and gender-based differences in missing persons cases. In this particular example, a plus one article from a couple years ago, the authors found that indeed black children faced recovery chances that were worse than white children. The literature on this topic is clear that bias against people of color, and in particular, Black Americans, is obvious. There are ways in which the criminal justice system does not treat people of color the same as it treats white people. This reality caused Dr. DeGange and I some concern, or has caused us concern for a long time, but which resulted in several contributions that we authored over the last several months. We framed these contributions with a question, should ancestry estimation continue? And so in an editorial to the Journal of Forensic Sciences that was published in early view over the summer and is now available in the September 2020 issue of the Journal of Forensic Sciences, we raised the question for the first time that there were more problems with ancestry estimation that forensic, than forensic anthropologists had previously considered or discussed. In this particular contribution, we specifically called for a moratorium on the use of macromorphoscopic traits or some of those cranial characteristics. And we also called attention to the way in which ancestry estimates might hinder the process of human identification based on the characteristics of the decedent from the biological profile that we provide. We expounded upon our thoughts in a more recent and expanded piece in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. And we invite any listeners to this webinar or our Q&A to take a look at both of these pieces, which are available as open access contributions in both the Journal of Forensic Sciences and the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. We know that these contributions have caused a high degree of conversation within the field of forensic anthropology. And we are proud to be part of the catalyst which have sparked this discussion. There have been many kinds of online events that have discussed these topics most recently a webinar that took place in February titled Blinded by the White, Forensic Anthropology and Ancestry Estimation. You'll see a lineup of these talks, one of which was authored by Dr. Deganji, one of our discussants here in our webinar at USF. And we are, we encourage people who are interested in this topic to take a look at the YouTube channel of this webinar if you are interested in having more information. Again, the webinar or the question and answer period that Dr. DeGange and I are participating in will also be recorded and will be available for anyone to access. So in essence, I invite you to take a look at this content, to think about the questions that we're posing, and to join the dialogue that asks how and why forensic anthropologists utilize ancestry estimation as a tool. And we would like to know what you think about this topic. And we look forward to entertaining any kinds of questions that you might have. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Department of Anthropology's Diversity and Inclusion Committee for inviting our remarks on this very important topic.